Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second of the series of Imaginive webinars, Shaping the Future of Healthcare with AI. My name is Tasha Stankovic. I am a PhD student in genomic medicine at the University of Cambridge, founder of Innovation Forum Serbia, and I will be your host for this event. This webinar is organized by Innovation Forum organization in collaboration with Sans Technology Park Belgrade, Health Tech Lab and Tech London Advocates Balkans. We're all here today thanks to the Imagine If Accelerator program for startups in healthcare run by Innovation Forum, which from the very beginning, since it was introduced in Serbia, had a clear mission to establish a firm platform of healthcare and business professionals, young innovators and investors for boosted development of healthcare startups in Serbia, stronger interdisciplinary and international collaboration and attraction of local and global investment. For the realization of the program in this event, we own special gratitude to our official sponsors, Roche, AstraZeneca, Oxquant and Swiss Contact as well as to our partners and a strong network of industrial and academic representatives that closely work with us. In the center of the attention, we put topics and ideas with the potential to revolutionize the way we practice medicine and treat patients, as well as individuals who are driving the discovery and implementation of those changes. One of those topics is artificial intelligence. It has been playing a robust and growing role in the world for the past few decades, and it presents itself in many forms that impact daily life. One major area where AI is growing rapidly is the medical field. As there is a fear of AI surpassing human tasks and ability, there is a significant research as to how AI can aid in clinical decisions support human judgment and uh, increase treatment efficiency. What are the current applications of AI in healthcare? What are the fears and hopes for AI? These are all the topics that, it will be, that we will be interested in during today's discussion. While founders should lead the way, governments are feeders of ecosystem success. They're responsible to provide a stable academic system to educate young talents um, and build financial and policy supported mechanisms that will enable translation of emerging disruptive scientific ideas into revolutionary technologies. That's why I will start the introduction of our speakers with a lady who immersed herself in many sectors to drive the change in Serbian ecosystem, closely working with the government, academia, and industrial partners. Her name is uh, Dr. Milica Djuric Jovicic. She is an acting director of the Science Fund in the Republic of Serbia. She has been director of Innovation Center at the School of Electrical Engineering at the University of Belgrade since 2013. Her mission today, leading Serbian Science Fund, is to assist the social, technological, cultural and economic development of the Republic of Serbia by financing scientific and R&D projects from all areas. Our next panelist is uh, Paul Agapov. Uh, he is a Health Informatics Director for AstraZeneca, using machine learning and real-world evidence for better development of therapeutics in uh, oncology. Welcome, Paul. Our third panelist, Galia Varier, is a technical program manager at Microsoft. She works for the commercial software engineering team, where she collaborates closely on software development projects with healthcare customers around the globe, incorporating the application of AI, data analytics, and machine learning. And um, our last panelist, um, Dr. Vladimir Kovacevic, is a bioinformatics analyst working for Seven Bridges on creating, optimizing, and running bioinformatics analysis, such as reconstruction of the whole genomes. In parallel, he has been teaching a course of genome informatics at the School of Electrical Engineering for three years. Last uh, but not least, uh, our great moderator, uh, Petr Savic, uh, welcome, Petr. 
Uh, Petar is an entrepreneur with a keen interest in acceleration within an emerging deep technologies. Uh, moreover, he is the founding partner of a London-based deep tech accelerator fund, Supreme Factory, uh, connecting the Balkans with the UK and beyond. Uh, today we will have uh, fantastic speakers and um, I will let them to introduce themselves. So just very briefly, um, who are you? And again, welcome. Uh, Galia, we can start with. Uh, hi, uh, Galia Warrior. I'm a technical program manager at Microsoft based in London, UK, and I work in a team where we collaborate uh, with uh, our healthcare customers across across the globe. Glad to be here. Thank you. Well, maybe we could we could start with Milica. Can you please introduce yourself? Yes, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Milica Djuricovic. I am acting director of the Science Fund of the Republic of Serbia. Paul? Hi, I'm Paul Agapal from AstraZeneca, uh, Health Informatics Director. We use machine learning, real-world evidence in therapy development. Finally, Vladimir. And Vladimir. Uh, hi, I'm bioinformatics analyst from, uh, from Seven Bridges. Uh, I have a technical background in electrical engineering, and I, I switched to, to biomedical sciences and the bioinformatics uh, five years ago. Since then, I've been working on analysis of the genomics data, predicting the uh, cancer markers, reconstructing genome and extracting user information from, uh, from it. Okay, great. Well, let's get straight to it then. I would like to ask the first question to, to Galia. Could you briefly explain what the machine learning data science and AI is and what is the difference? Here you've been uh, working in Microsoft for a long time and I had the pleasure of working with you in some projects like Teams in AI and Acre and Aspirations, we're young people and you did a great job of, of explaining AI even to kids or to, to, to anyone who, who doesn't know much, so please. Right, well, thanks Peter, <laughs> no, no pressure. So I, I wanted to start with a bit of a joke which has been uh, coined by our colleagues at Microsoft. Uh, so you're saying that the difference between machine learning and AI is that if it's written in Python, it's probably machine learning. And if it's written in PowerPoint, it's probably AI. Well, there's a bit of a joke element to that, but uh, reality is that there's been a lot of hype in the last few years around the potential of AI, and um, especially starting with the more of advanced of deep learning uh, algorithm and techniques in place. Realistically, what we see in the world is that most of the business value is driven by the standard, very well-known, very well-explained um, use of supervised learning, whether it's classification or regression. And it's basically learning those inputs and mapping outputs effectively. And now we can see that they work still very well. They are coupling with uh, them with deep learning uh, neural network algorithms. It, it makes things much more effective at the scale. And I think one of the reasons why it's so exciting to be working with these technologies now is the fact that we, we've enabled the development of a lot of powerful and useful applications across various industries. And you can think of just application of speech, computer vision, machine lang uh, language translation, general natural language processing uh, algorithm. Within your specific area of work, it's likely already been happening for a while or it will be there very soon. Amazing. That's a very good explanation. Thank you, Galia. And I would like to ask a next question to Paul and Vladimir. And it is about if you could give me some uh, good examples of applied AI in, in, in healthcare, uh, whether that's a drug discovery, precision medicine, diagnosing microbiome or robotics in surgery or even telemedicine. Okay, Vladimir, do you want to go first? No, it's me. Okay, so <laughs> I'll try not to say anything that Vladimir is going to say. I think the chief way in which AI and machine learning can be useful in healthcare is in what we technically call sort of non-parametric problems. We very dimly understand uh, most biological systems. So using detailed statistics is often statistical models is, is not appropriate to handle these things. So AI and machine learning gives us a leg up on these complicated, messy systems. So for example, something like uh, drug discovery. There is this terrible attrition rate through drug discovery. You might have seen that you start out with something like 10,000 
candidate chemicals, you might end up with one usable drug. Machine learning gives us a way we can wield and meld in all these other types of information in order to optimize this process. Another way, and this kind of, this sounds very prosaic, is just finding patients with particular diseases. You know, you might think that it would be clear to find all the patients who had breast cancer, all the patients who had prostate cancer or uh, ILD or something like that within a hospital record, but that's not actually quite clear. Machine learning, NLP, things like that, gives us ways that we can more easily recognize and find and type patients from the cacophony of data that we have available to us. Vladimir, over to you. Yes, it, it's very interesting uh, uh, to think about uh, why artificial, artificial intelligence and machine lear learning penetrated so deeply into, into so many different, not only health and medical areas, but uh, different uh, areas of life in general. So the way I see that there are a couple of uh, reasons, so, sorry for going a little uh, out of the question. But uh, I think that the first one is uh, that it is something that we used to read about when we were when we were little in asset novels and uh, we fantasize about and nowadays it became reality. And the second thing is uh, these large community efforts that uh, enabled users with minimal technical and programming knowledge to train and use models easily, sometimes even with a, with a few lines of code. And uh, the third thing is uh, it actually gives uh, good results very uh, very fast, so th this is why this is why it, uh, it entered uh, into so so many areas. Uh, uh, what uh, Paul, Paul mentioned, I, I would mention also image analysis, so recognition of, uh, uh, for example, melanoma detection analysis of the of the brain images, uh, also healthcare administration, uh, voice recognition to, to be used there to, to speed up uh, things. Then the immunotherapy and the, the cancer treatment, which uh, we will tell about uh, later and later. And uh, of course, all, all of that uh, uh, is mostly related to finding also the causes of the diseases. For example, finding uh, which exact genes are connected to, to which diseases. So, yeah, you, you can talk about it probably uh, every day, all day. I'm sure, but thank you so much for, for that great explanation of applied AI in, in healthcare. And Milica, would you like to tell me more about from uh, what do you really, what are you really excited about in your work uh, and the experience you had in, in, in Serbia by working on some of the AI related projects? Yes, of course. Um... Now with uh, all the all these new possibilities that are introduced not only by technology but also by um, creating uh, the data and uh, uh, having all this hype about um, either machine learning or deep learning AI, however the research team wants to uh, want to call it, uh, it is definitely very exciting um, period to be engineer or computer scientist or. Uh, actually any kind of uh, researcher or developer that is related to this industry. Uh, as the science fund of the Republic of Serbia uh, had this special call that is dedicated to AI, uh, we invested uh, 2.4 million euros for programs that are related to uh, AI applications. Not only for uh, applications in health, but uh, any kind of uh, AI that will be um, developed and uh, put to some good use by uh, Serbian research community. So with this special uh, with this special program, we had uh, actually 70 applicants, and uh, which is actually 70 teams from different parts of uh, Serbia, and it was very attractive and very interesting call for all of them. And we were excited to see uh, what are the proposals, uh, what are they. Um, dreaming to do or to develop, and uh, for the um, for the let's um, uh, say very multidisciplinary uh, area, very significant, uh, definitely with some uh, limitations and some major um, uh, opportunities. So it is a very exciting area for us, and uh, this is now finalized. That the program is now uh, starting. We have selected 
12 programs, uh, 12 projects, and they they uh, they will do um, their project implementation in the next two uh, in the next two years. Uh, unfortunately, uh, only one of the grants um, is related to health and AI, but uh, we will discuss about that. Uh, I think further during this uh, topic. Yeah, thank you. I was going to ask you what's the, what's the percentage of the healthcare in, in the system, because I'm sure there is a lack of access to capital in the Balkan region. However, uh, the global venture capital is is booming in, in terms of healthcare. And uh, it's very interesting what you do and how you're supporting our scientists. And I call this um, uh, more of a venture science than venture capital because you're investing in, in some great PhDs and some amazing projects and really innovative solutions. Um, and where do you see now a Serbian ecosystem compared to the rest of the, I guess, emerging Europe when it comes to AI uh, and then that grant funding? Uh, this is still uh, being uh, analyzed. Uh, it is very hard to, to uh, make this, this distinguish because we have a lot of uh, Serbian scientists and engineers, engineers that are working abroad and actually uh, try to work and collaborate with uh, either Serbian companies and, uh, or, or Serbian uh, scientific institutions. And uh, so what we can see is that uh, we have not only uh, potential and uh, people who know how to do it, but also some uh, very interesting and um, uh, very important results in AI applications. Uh, what I also wanted to mention about our call and everything that the Science Fund uh, does, uh, all our research and uh, uh, all our applicants uh, uh, prepare their proposals in English, and this is evaluated by international um, first uh, reviewers and then expert panel. So for our program, we hired uh, experts from uh, from USA and UK and experts from Switzerland, and uh, we asked them to be uh, really be, uh, really be very hard and critical because we want to select top projects that are uh, not only bring uh, something in AI but also something that can be uh, representable to anybody else around the world. And based on that, they really selected it was part of the kitchen. And uh, what was finally selected, they claimed that those are the projects that would be also supported in their own countries. This is the top quality and uh, quality uh, in terms of novelty, in, ter in terms of impact, in terms of implementation, and the quality of team. So I think this is this is very good part for uh, this kind of program. And I'm also very excited that uh, Serbia as a government, as, as a country, uh, they're now uh, in starting implementation of their this special strategy and action plan that, that is uh, dedicated to uh, AI and development in AI. So I think that this uh, will have more investment in AI, not only in research, but also in industry. And that I think can really contribute for the uh, any kind of uh, um, problem or uh, uh, application in health, quality of life, uh, urban living, uh, safety, you name it. Yeah, that's some amazing news. Thank you for sharing that. And you mentioned uh, briefly about negotiations with universities and then kind of uh, being able to commercialize that um, or internationalize those pinouts from PhDs and academic projects. Um, let me ask this to question to Vladimir, uh, and it's about IP transfer. What is your honest opinion about IP transfer and how complex that can be when you want to de develop something within the academia and then scale it and or globalize it? Well, in a short, uh, it could be very complex, but... Uh, uh, if you take the small steps, then it's much simpler, like uh, like, like with most of the problems. Uh, so if, uh, if you want to talk about building a, a strategy or a community for AI in health, um, I can maybe share my experiences that, uh, that, that we have with uh, introducing bioinformatics to, uh, to the Serbian community and, uh, and the faculties. 
And uh, in essence, bioinformatics is a science of collecting and analyzing complex biological and medical data. So uh, in, in AI in health falls into, into this area. So the current situation is uh, that uh, we have a bioinformatics course. Uh, it's been going for uh, three years in School of Electrical Engineering. And uh, we have another bioinformatics uh, course in the Faculty of Programming and Mathematics. It's been going for, for five years. And uh, this was enabled by a possibility that uh, uh, members of the industry are partic participating in uh, uh, in teaching uh, some some subjects on uh, on a usually master or PhD uh, PhD studies, and uh, we, we have a good cooperation, and uh, we've been able to to create uh, the course. The students were uh, were, were very interesting. So uh, as as a first small step that, that could happen in, in this direction is uh, to try uh, to introduce uh, some some parts of uh, AI. In health, into into bioinformatics, and with a few lectures, and uh, uh, and uh, in time, in a year, two or three, three years, it could uh, it could develop into uh, into separate uh, uh, separate course. Uh, that, that's something uh, that I can see as an uh, as an opportunity. It's, it's a very popular area, and uh, we had uh, good experiences uh, with applying. Uh, uh, many students. Uh, our our subject at School of Electrical Engineering was uh, uh, took a record for applying uh, uh, the, the the number of students that never applied to any other uh, any other different uh, uh, different subject. So I think that's a that's a good starting point to uh, to try to contact uh, not only government owned but also private faculties. I think that they will also be uh, even more uh, interesting in. Uh, in uh, having the uh, courses of uh, of that curriculum in their institutions, uh, then uh, we can also think about uh, possibilities of uh, uh, organizing or uh, creating possibilities for internships. In, in the nowadays, the new era that we uh, entered without uh, the concession, uh, many things uh, are being happening online and. Uh, we should maybe seek opportunities. So it is now able to, to connect uh, possibly foreign companies uh, that, uh, that could give online internships to the students that have, that listen to, the, to those subjects and the faculties and that have some basic knowledge of uh, artificial intelligence and its uh, application in, uh, in health. Uh, so the, those are some of the things that, uh, that, that um, it crossed my mind the last last couple of days when when I was thinking uh, about about this discussion, but uh, I would be more than happy to to listen to, to your experiences from the UK, uh, and uh, of course to try to to see how how it could be applied and maybe take some uh, concrete steps. Yeah, amazing. I'm sure we're gonna share loads of uh, connections. Uh... Uh, further on and, and 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 get some make good examples but thank you for sharing that so i would like to to ask paul about um a general kind of global scene how it looks like at the moment because obviously astrazeneca is a global leader when it comes to uh, uh, applying ai in healthcare and i think to, it's some somewhere around 80 percent of the uh, projects are basically they they come from 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 uh, AstraZeneca, which is absolutely fascinating. So, what what would be those biggest trends that you see, Paul, coming out at the moment? Mm. Okay, so uh, this is inevitably going to be shaped by my own biases and interests. So, I think what we're living in at the moment is a transition between the interesting but not useful stage of AI to the useful, at least in terms of healthcare. I mean, certainly that's being a bit dismissive. You know, we've seen these great advances through things, image recognition, speech recognition, and so forth, and all that work comes out of Google. But in a way, a lot of that feels in retrospect now like low hanging fruit. Now we're actually having to do with difficult, deal with difficult, real problems. So, one of the things that fascinates me is the way we're now moving towards graphs and knowledge graphs 
for example. So we're not just talking about a simple neural network or a, we're moving out of table land, I like to talk about, and we're moving into the cacophony of data that's necessary for the real world. So we can take things like knowledge graphs where we have sparse, incomplete, and perhaps unreliable evidence and turn these towards finding out which drug agents are possibly the more promising or which patient subtypes there are out there and so forth. The other big threads, I think, that are happening within AI will be to do with data, just simply data, where we're going to get it from, how we're going to get it together. We have a voracious appetite for it, but it's quite obvious that AI, we fall over sometimes when we deal with biased data sets, with limited data sets, with sparse data sets, yet that is the data that we have at the moment. So how are we going to make these bigger data sets as more representative, more useful ones out there? And how can we use unstructured data better? Because most of the information that describes our world is at best poorly structured. So those would be the threads that I'd pick. Uh, so, Galia, I would like to uh, go to you and ask you more about uh, Microsoft's um, innovation hubs like Reactor and Microsoft for Startups. We obviously <laughs> share the same building. Our, <laughs> uh, right. My office is there as well. So I would like to ask you for some of the examples of how you collaborate with, with startups, academia, industry in, in, in promotion of AI. And I know that, um, for example, Microsoft announced earlier this year a launch of a new AI for health uh, project. So can you potentially tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So uh, as Microsoft is such a large organization, naturally, we do work with different parts of the ecosystem. So on the startup uh, side, I think I, I, I'm happy to mention the, our partnership with AstraZeneca and it's around the uh, AI factory, which is a partnership in France where we support startups through the, you know, which going through the startup accelerator and it's specifically uh, dedicated into finding the new ways of using AI within health related solutions. And some of those um, um, kind of ideas and areas which uh, Paul just described around medical imaging, around, you know, connecting the patient data, understanding the kind of, uh, you know, mining the data sets and understanding a bit more about the patients and also within the drug discovery side. Uh, that's kind of one of the areas where we work with startups. We also work with uh, non-profits and there are uh, kind of areas around AI for good and AI for health. Uh, one of just one of the examples, which is again maybe more of a simple uh, way of using specific technology, which is chatbots and kind of coupling it with the custom imaging. But that was uh, work which our team actually did with Novartis Foundation, and that was to develop uh, AI-enabled so that kind of was capability digital assistant for uh, uh, lep uh, to, to detect leprosy, which is uh, one of the oldest diseases known. It's pretty much eradicated most of the world, but there's still estimated two, three million people who are still living with this um, uh, with this disability and overall kind of stigmatization, stigmatization in, in, the, in the society. And essentially we built, uh, and for that disease to be, you know, for the people to be healthy, people need to know that, you know, there's a multi-drug uh, therapy available and it's free of charge for them. But uh, to early detect those, um, you know, skin is kind of, uh, to, to see it on the skin, you need to see those um, images early enough. And obviously the areas where it's really hard to access for a hard to reach communities with poor access to healthcare overall in some of the developing countries, uh, this is where this, using the mobile application where you can actually take a photo and send it through the service and actually get the response very quickly or you have a, actually a doctor, medical doctor who will take a look at the image and can actually give additional diagnosis is extremely helpful. So it's kind of one of the examples where it may be something we've heard a lot in the kind of other industry spaces, but it's, it's, it's making a real change in people's lives. Yeah, it seems like you're you're doing quite a lot in, in that field. But I'm particularly interested to learn more about the collaboration between AstraZeneca and Microsoft, the uh, particularly AI factory for health, and then well, what can pharma companies gain in collaboration with 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 IT companies um, like Microsoft, um, Paul or Galia? 
I guess yeah. I can. Oh, sorry. No, I'll no, just, no, no, you first. A couple of things, and then <laughs> you make the company. <laughs> Give another view. It would be interesting to hear your perspective as well. Yeah. I think it's for us. It's all about combining our, you know, what we know from Microsoft perspective. We are a technology company. We are a platforms company. We have the infrastructure and cloud, and actually bringing those capabilities, bringing specifically for the, you know, startups, it's bringing the technical advisory, uh, you know, resources who can help them to go through the progress of, you know, building their solutions on, on the platforms. I think that's one of the important things where we see and also we can help to bring them in our ecosystem of partners and actually uh, bring them to market with, with our you know help too this is the way we see that collaboration and Paul anything on your side yeah no no absolutely okay so uh in in fact I think Ali's made a good point there's this whole issue of infrastructure there that uh I'm frequently guilty of saying to to people in uh, scientific context that like I I don't care about computers and networks and everything like that. I just want it to work. And so there's that whole engineering aspect out there. You know, you might have a million patient records, but how can you deliver them to the people and the places that need them? You know, how can you uh, deploy machine learning systems in a robust way? So it's very important for that whole informatics and infrastructure aspect to just work, you know, to enable. And I think Astra is very good at recognizing that there are things that they do well and that there are things that they can get other people to do, to do well. And in a broader sense, I think a lot of these problems here require knowledge from different areas you know we need people who are good at that engineering aspect we need people who are good at the informatics and the coding and the machine learning and we need people from the domain and if you isolate those too much from each other if you try to do them and then just assemble them at the end that is just not going to work you do need a good collaborative relationship to get good results out in the end. There, Peter, does that do for you? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, it's you mentioned the infrastructure and the, actually the whole ecosystem. And I'm interested to learn from Vladimir, oh, well, what are your thoughts, Vladimir, on this potential in the Balkans? Because Balkan is being a, a heart of emerging Europe and especially Serbia, who's uh, very much growing in deep tech and R&D hubs. Um, so what do you think, what are your thoughts about potential of, of AI and healthcare kind of infrastructure within this uh, our region? Is it a fertile ground or is something still to come? Well, we also spoke about, uh, about it uh, briefly and uh, I, I didn't comment, uh, I, I didn't know some of the things that, that she mentioned and uh, let me just, just say that uh, I'm happy that things are, are, are moving and they are moving in a uh, in a good direction. Um, of, of course, the, this this area it could be fertile. It has uh, it, it has good, good genetical background, <laughs> uh, but uh, unfortunately we are uh, stuck a lot with uh, with administration and uh, uh, for certain things they take two or three times uh, more time to, uh, to to be done or to to be acquired and uh, from uh, to, to be concrete uh, from the infrastructure uh, I, I think uh, what's lacking uh, in Serbia by, by speaking to, to my other colleagues uh, nowadays uh, is uh, switching to, to cloud infrastructure uh, I, I think still more than many um, institutes or or, uh, or faculties laboratories that they, they are still using uh, and struggling with, uh, with the local uh, local clusters, uh, supercomputers, uh, and uh, they are uh, uh, they are not aware of the of the possibilities, uh, and uh, they are, it's taking too much time for them to to run the uh, the processing, the the analysis, and to to maintain uh, all the infrastructure. So I think this is uh, some of the directions that uh, uh, that it's good to to be headed to. I hope that covers your question. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for, for answering that. And now for the next part of, of our conversations, we're going to be to, speaking of, talking about uh, AI and healthcare in, in particular. And for that reason, I would like to invite Stasha back to the stage to to try to lead this um, this part of the event. Stasha? Yeah, so as, as we already mentioned, the increasing availability of healthcare data and, and rapid development of big data analytic methods has made possible the recent successful applications of AI in healthcare. In my personal example, um, we used uh, AI um, to personalize health uh, screening and treatments for cancer. And um, in general, this does not only benefit the patients, but the clinicians too, um, enabling them to make the best use of, of their skills, um, informing decisions, and, and also saving time. Um, so maybe for, for the rest of the discussions, um, we will be moving into more specific examples and and motivations of applying AI in your specific companies and, and ecosystems. So, um, Galia, what I what I am interested in is um, what kind of data types uh, are you using uh, to be analyzed by AI? Um, what are the mechanisms that uh, enable those AI systems to generate the results which are clinically um, uh, meaningful? So, in, in the in a, in a, um, from the perspective of a, a clinical world. And uh, also, what are the disease types that you are targeting with these uh, AI solutions? Right. Um, so that obviously quite plenty of examples on the various sides. I think the, the one I just want to talk about, one of the projects which um, our team has been involved actually uh, last year, and that's been in, in London. And that was, uh, again, a collaboration as, you know, everybody's talking and Paul, I think, mentioned that we also need to have the domain expert. It's not only the compute. It's not only the engineering effort. It's always the domain. And um, so we worked together with uh, UCL and Great Ormond Street Hospitals. And that was a project which was aiming to improve physiotherapy care for children with cystic fibrosis which is a chronic uh, life-limiting condition. It's about, uh, around uh, 1 in 2,500 uh, children are born with that. And it's actually, um, you know, there's been improved prevention. There's no real treatment for that. But uh, the, the, the hope is that we can increase life expectancy and currently stands at the average of about 40 years old uh, for, for those uh, people with this disease. So in this particular scenario, when we were collecting data and how we were using it for with the, with the you know this kind of AI um, look at it, uh, that the, the, there was a device which is a sensor has been um, connected to a specific equipment, and it would uh, the, the idea is that for the um, each of the kid would have their own um, kind of treatment. They would need to have uh, spe specific breathing exercises and. It's fairly boring for them because they have to do it very regularly and there's not really nothing exciting for them and it's pretty much for their life. And what what the idea was there and that was part of the project that it would be a, a video game for them. While they were doing the breathing exercise, it would be a video game. So there was that gaming aspect. But at the same time, while they were doing that, we were collecting a lot of data, how every single breath essentially was collected and that how we're doing that. There was a, also a Fitbit devices they were using to get the uh, additional measurements around around the um, kind of how the body reacts, and essentially the team, uh, our collaboration with the um, UCL researchers was that we were analyzing this data. We were using the machine learning techniques and the clustering various clustering techniques at scale to actually create a highly focused advice. So it was a personalized advice to the individual patients and overall it was a uh, very successful because for kids they obviously you know six seven years old they they were super excited to be part of it because it was fun for them at the same time for the researchers it's uh, probably the first time that they could get so close to analyzing this data at such scale and at such um granular um you know element so i think it's one of the interesting projects and i was a part of it as well so it was uh, really great to see it happening and actually changing lives Uh, back to Sasha. I think Sasha is. Oh, Sasha, we can't hear you. Or can you hear us? Um, can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Yeah. Now moving from uh, let's call them more rare diseases into more complex diseases that involve 
larger number of patients, uh, such as um, clinical trials. Um, we saw in the past that AI has many potential applications in clinical trials, both near and, and long term. And um, AI technologies make possible innovations that are fundamental for transforming clinical trials. Um, for example, combining phase one and phase two clinical trials, um, developing novel patient-centered endpoints, um, as well as having um, data-driven protocols and strategies that are powered by advanced AI algorithms um, that process data from, let's say, mobile uh, sensors and apps, as well as electronic uh, medical and uh, uh, admin administrative uh, records. Um, I've been aware that uh, AstraZeneca has been involved in uh, in patient monitoring and, and uh, revolutionizing the way we perform clinical trials. So, Paul, uh, could you please tell us uh, about that side of the story, but also um, what are the uh, other examples of applications of AI that AstraZeneca is currently incorporating into every okay. So I, I think there is, there is an industry-wide push towards AI and clinical trials for a lot of good reasons. Uh, those who are less close to the pharmaceutical industry may not appreciate just how critical and how fraught clinical trials are. Uh, they're tremendously expensive to run. They take a long time to run. And they're one of the key reasons that we have um, so many drugs fail. They fail in the clinical trial phase and why it takes so long to develop a drug. So obviously there are benefits there in optimizing that process, making it faster, and making it more efficient. Uh, one of the reasons, as I said, one of the ways rather that AI can help is, as I said earlier, just in identifying patients. This is this cruel, uh, strange need that we have. We cannot test a drug unless we can find enough people to test it on and to test it on a statistically robust number and a reasonable population. Yet I think something like a third of clinical trials fail to find the number of patients that they need to run. Something like uh, even a fifth of them, I think, fail to find even half the patients they want. So we end up with all these underpowered clinical trials in there contributing to all the failure rate. There is also just the whole issue of how we handle digitization. Now, digital trials, I think, are this great potential win for us. Rather than having to get a patient to visit the doctor's office once a month, and do a series of tests to be assessed there. We can have wearables, devices, all sorts of things on them that monitor how they are doing around the clock, what's happening to them. But in order to harness and use this flood of data, we actually need AI to be able to wrangle that and interpret that there. And there's one very big thing in trials and actually in development, and that's the whole idea of what actual disease does a patient have. It's painfully aware to us now that a lot of the times uh, when we're talking about a particular disease, a disease that has a certain clinical presentation, as they say, people may actually have some different condition underneath. You know, uh, for example, those of you who watch my Twitter or LinkedIn feed will have seen today I pushed out a paper that we did on asthma and how patients with asthma seem to have at least four different diseases running on the background that all get lumped together as asthma. Obviously, to treat these people effectively, we need to understand and cluster them and type them into these groups. And this requires wrangling and analyzing a great deal of longitudinal data, a lot of omics and molecular data, a lot of clinical data in there. So there's lots of opportunities in there, Stasa, that we could go with. I guess now we're coming to the point where we discuss so-called clinical odyssey, where we have a single patient going from one specialist to another specialist due to the inability to, to precisely uh, diagnose the patient and treat them correctly. And um, I believe, uh, I'll switch now to Vladimir because this uh, also is, is very relevant to uh, the key. 
Okay, I believe we lost Stasha there for a second. Hopefully she will come back. Um, yes, she's back. And welcome back. Um, yes, uh, somehow um, I drop out. Better you kick me all the time. <laughs> but now I'm back. So uh, what, what, what I was referring to is that this clinical odyssey is very relevant to the key moment in the field of genetics where we had the ability to read the human genome letter by letter, and uh, from these letters being nucleotides, detect changes in the human genome responsible for the development of complex and rare diseases. And by incorporating genomic medicine, we are trying now to tackle this clinical odyssey, and by mainstreaming genomic medicine into everyday healthcare, we are actually helping those clinicians to uh, pick the right target for the disease, and behind that target, we can see uh, uh, what, what is the disease code by the, the certain mutation. And many of the techniques that you described above have been adopted to address the various steps involved in clinical genomic analysis to interpret human genome data. And an um, AI system extracts useful information from a large patient population to assist making real-time inferences for health risk alert and health outcome prediction. Um, Vladimir, uh, seven bridges um, are being involved in developing flat platforms to analyze and interpret genomics data. Um, uh, could you please um, describe what kind of work you perform at seven bridges? And um, in what way is this relevant to so-called clinical odyssey that we just mentioned? In what way we are assisting um, our clinicians in helping them to diagnose patients as soon as possible to avoid this? long uh, uh, passing of the patient from one clinician to another. Thank you. So, so the main product of the system is to plot-based genomics or bioinformatics platform uh, that enables uh, easy access to the cloud resources and uh, bioinformatics genomics tools to be used by, by scientists, by bioinformaticians, by people with, uh, that do not have that much technical knowledge. So uh, with uh, literally un unlimited computational resources, uh, it is possible to upload, to, to store, store data and uh, to perform the, the analysis or, uh, of, of any kind. So we, uh, we offer also expertise, the consulting, the, uh, uh, best ways to to perform the the analysis. Uh, I, will, I will give a couple of uh, examples. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, so, some of the things that I've been working on is uh, new antigen discovery. So new antigens uh, are short proteins that are expressed uh, on the surface of the cancer cells. So they they represent cancer markers and they uh, they have huge application in immunotherapy and uh, in creating the uh, targeted vaccines that can uh, that can be applied to uh, to, to the patient, and uh, uh, with that, the the immune system will be uh, will be boosted and uh, able to to recognize and uh, destroy cancer cells. So this prediction of uh, new antigens is it's possible to perform uh, when uh, the, there is known sequence uh, data of the of the tumor tissue and on the uh, normal tissue, uh, together with the uh, optional RNA uh, RNA expression data. So by uh, by looking at uh, the differences between uh, uh, normal and uh, wild type and, uh, and tumor genomic sequences, uh, it is possible uh, to predict uh, which proteins uh, uh, will be expressed, and uh, when uh, when th these proteins are calculated, it is possible to predict. Uh, uh, with the uh, machine learning tools, the possibility, the probabilities uh, that they will be expressed uh, on the surface of the of the cancer cells. Thus, they uh, they became great candidates for uh, immunotherapy as uh, as being uh, cancer markers. So this is a uh, I would say very very complex uh, analysis. It starts from uh, raw sequenced uh, uh, data. And it is uh, consisted of uh, approximately 150 uh, bioinformatics tools that run in a, uh, in a parallel in a, in a huge graph. And uh, the result uh, of the analysis is basically a, a list of prioritized uh, neoantigen candidates that can be 
uh, that can be used in, uh, uh, in immunotherapy. So this is one of, one of the examples of application of the uh, AI in, uh, in health, in, in predicting the new antigen, something, something, something that I was working on. Uh, and uh, I, I want to tell you also about uh, other examples, something that, uh, that I did on my, on my free time. And uh, also to, to continue the, uh, the discussion about uh, building communities it could be some, some of the good ways for uh, building the community. Uh, I'm talking about dream challenges. Uh, dream challenges are designed and run by a community of researchers to answer important biological or medical questions. So the dream is acronym for dialogue for reverse engineering the assessment and, and methods. So in, in other words, uh, uh, the, the methods for, for reconstructing uh, uh, some published analysis or answers to some important questions that, uh, that the community wants to, uh, to reproduce and uh, uh, maybe to confirm them or deny them with, uh, with more amounts of, of data. So the dream organization uh, was uh, it's using the philosophy of uh, wisdom of the crowd uh, that provides a great impact on science and, and human health by fostering collaborations. So even though they are called challenges, it's uh, the main idea is not only competing, but uh, also fostering collaborations and uh, obtaining contacts between the researchers and strengthening their, uh, their results and ideas. Uh, so uh, it is uh, allowing uh, individuals and groups to collaborate openly. So particip participation is uh, open to, to anyone. And uh, the produced results are available to the community in, in standardized form, standardized data sets and benchmarking methods uh, for uh, eventual future comparisons, analysis and uh, uh, developments. So the participants are motivated both by recognition and uh, by, being, by being a part of the, uh, of the solution. And also anyone with a, with a good question and the data to answer that question can, uh, can propose uh, a, a dream challenge. It's being conducted on the Synapse platform, which is very convenient for uh, data exchange, for uh, commenting, for publishing results and exchange again. Uh, any sort of, uh, uh, of ideas. Uh, I, I, will, I will tell you briefly about the few challenges that I've been participating in the last, last couple of years. So uh, last year there, there was a challenge uh, about uh, uh, predicting uh, uh, the prediction of the gestation, gestational age uh, from uh, whole blood gene expression data uh, collected uh, from pregnant women. Uh, and, uh, the second part of the challenge was prediction of the uh, preterm birth, also from uh, uh, whole blood gene expression collected from uh, from pregnant uh, pregnant woman. Uh, I, I don't need to emphasize the importance of it. So knowing the the exact uh, uh, week of pregnancy is very important to to prevent uh, uh, potential uh, potential diseases. Uh, unfortunately, the, the result of this this first part. So the uh, the top uh, uh, the top score team they they get accuracy of around one month uh, in, in predicting it so it, it, it wasn't that good uh, it, it was funny the in the overview of the of the solution they uh, they wrote that they didn't manage to uh, to beat uh, uh, some um, some lady that's delivering babies that, that her own prediction cannot be uh, cannot be beaten. But luckily, the, the second part of the challenge with the predicting the, the potential or, uh, probability of, uh, of preterm delivery was uh, with much higher, uh, more than 90 percentage accuracy. Uh, and uh, it, was, uh, it, it was very important start for uh, introducing that kind of uh, analysis into, uh, into future medical exams. So uh, literally about taking the blood sample from uh, uh, from the pregnant lady, it is possible to to give a uh, probability or uh, or a risk for uh, uh, for a risk pregnancy. Uh, now, now, when we come back to to these collaborations and the community and the challenges that unites 
interdisciplinary young innovators and professionals. Um, I would like to ask Milica, so we, we just mentioned the, the collaboration between Microsoft and AstraZeneca, and um, we are aware that uh, both of the companies have representatives uh, in Serbia, which means that we are developing world-class science on, on both sites simultaneously. Um, are these collaborations the opportunity that Serbia can take and, and start leading some of the advantages in the AI sector? And um, are the examples such as the model of collaboration between AstraZeneca and Microsoft, um, do, can they serve as an example for boosting Serbian AI healthcare uh, ecosystem? And also, do any of these kind of initiatives already exist in, in Serbia? Uh, we can't hear Milica, Peter. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Mm -hmm. uh, th those are actually several questions and different issues. Um, uh, collaboration between uh, AstraZeneca and Microsoft is a wonderful example how something can be uh, um, the experience, the need, and uh, and uh, the, the the top quality and uh, um, top quality people can be joined together to solve uh, and uh, offer some new solutions. Uh, and this is collaboration within the industry, just different types of industry of, of or branches or however. Uh, uh, what we are trying to address is collaboration between science and industry, and this is also something very important but much more complex. Uh, not only because it is a different uh, kind of um, collaboration and, and the nature of scientists and how everything is regulated regarding the technology transfer, but also uh, there is a big gap between uh, the way how typical scientists or researchers work and organize and how, uh, and how fast uh, the, the industry needs some solutions or... or um, uh, improvements. Definitely, there is a there is a way to uh, combine many different uh, uh, parts of industry, or uh, science and industry, or even just scientists, and to help them to to identify some new uh, possibilities and generate solutions that can really make some something disruptive and uh, uh, important uh, to bring um, bring this solution on the map of the world, not only to, to help Serbia. Uh, I think that we will see this uh, more in the future, especially th because this field is uh, particularly attractive to young people. And uh, I see this uh, entrepreneurial spirit now in the, uh, in the research area, in the young in engineering students as well. So I think that... Uh, if we meet uh, next year or year after that, we will be very happy to discuss uh, some success that is uh, um, uh, started here in, in Serbia, in any town or part of Serbia, and uh, it is becoming global and important uh, on, the, on the world map of uh, AI experts and investors as well. So I think definitely uh, we will enjoy uh, reading this news and uh, learning from those young people. Now, now, moving back into more the scientific part of AI again, um, and I would like to invite Peter to take on this session, but I'll just give a short uh, introduction. So uh, there has been considerable attention to the concern that AI will lead to uh, automation of jobs and uh, displacement of the workforce. Um, I, I would like to discuss with all of you what are the ethical implications of, of AI and what are the fears and hopes that AI will bring in future. Uh, Petar, uh, can you lead on this, please? Thank you very much, Sasha. Yeah, I would like to ask uh, a question to Paul, uh, and it's about the applied AI and the reality of it. Is it reality that we are facing that AI is is everywhere and we are using it it's just hidden somewhere or is this to be like a future and you know, i'm not sure about ai taking our jobs maybe we're just going to adopt our jobs to yeah. ai but w w what would be that adoption rate so far when it comes to kind of real ai being applied oh wow so that is just a big huge question that you've asked me there and i'm not even sure where to start with but let me 
let me put it this way. Of course, you know, there is this great talk where people talk about, you know, AI takes over and the singularity and everything like that. And there was this delightful paper by the uh, US AI scientist, Patty Mays, who, uh, when she asked a bunch of scientists when they thought like AI was going to take over the world and things like that, she correlated it against their age. And they all, all almost to a person, predicted AI would take over when they turned 65. Um, <laughs> so I, I think perhaps, you know, we're, we're dealing almost with wishful thinking with a lot of that. It's very unpredictable. Um, but look, I think AI is going to slowly and invisibly move into our lives. As I said earlier, I think we're moving from the phase of the interesting things of the low hanging fruit. Now we're going towards the difficult problems and these will take a lot longer to take over. I'm not particularly concerned. I don't, I don't think our lives are going to change overnight, even if they did from a, a virus this year. But uh, there's still a lot of work for us, at least over the next decade. And uh, that's, that will be my prediction then for when AI will take over. Before we go to the threats, I would like to discuss a few potential problems that, that might bring um, uh, bring us in, in near future. And, and Milica, you mentioned in investors and, and potential capital that Serbia and then Balkans in general can attract in terms of AI and healthcare. Um, could you potentially explain how the intellectual property and kind of commercializing those projects that you're financing could, could affect the investors or attract the investors? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, for uh, what we are doing now uh, in supporting uh, research in AI, um, we give uh, all the applicants opportunity to regulate their own IP. So uh, at this point, we want to see AI development and uh, the, there is a national law that regulates uh, the IP of um, scientific and research institutions, either faculties or, uh, or institutes. So uh, we also have uh, some technology transfer offices at universities, not on all universities, but uh, uh, there are some. And uh, if there is a will to, to get this uh, transferred to, to industry, there is a way that uh, dean or directors can, can handle this uh, in accordance with the law. And this is not only for, uh, for seeing this kind of... Uh, uh, let's say, uh, research download and uh, development downloads to, to industry, but also related to any kind of uh, patent or any kind of um, uh, significant uh, IP potential that should be... Uh... Okay, I'm not sure if I can't hear you or everyone else. No, it's mm -hmm. fine. We just lost you there for a second. Um, okay. Mm, let's see if, if you come back. Okay. Well, let me let me ask the, another question. Um, and this question is about threats. And what are the threats um, for applying AI to, to healthcare? And what would be good, bad, and potentially ugly situations? Uh, that we might face? Would that be our security issues, data quality, uh, different consents and governments? Galia, would you like to tell back. us more about those things? Oh, sorry. Oh, we have... Okay. Milit is back. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I had a technical issue. I'm, I'm not sure if you heard me. We just heard you a, a bit to, to a certain part. But yeah, maybe you can, you can finish your thought. That would be yeah. great. Yes, uh, the thing is that we would like to have uh, more, uh, not only publications and uh, conference presence of our AI uh, teams, but we would like to see more patents and more te technology transfer uh, to, to see this uh, put to, in, uh, to industry. And for this reason, 
We are strongly supportive uh, for uh, regulating IP issues between uh, scientists and the research institutions and to having, having this uh, opportunity to be downloaded to, to industry. Well, that's fantastic news. I think that most of the investors and co-investors partners in our network will be happy to hear that. So thank you for, for pushing that. So Galia, back to you. Could you potentially explain more about uh, threats that we might be facing in, in, in healthcare data and AI, whether that's a security issue, data quality of governance and sharing of data? I think it's not even threats. I think it's just general state of the, where the industry is. Is a lot of um, a lot of issues around uh, data sharing. So you, the healthcare industry being heavily regulated, you naturally want to be extra secure. You need to be a very um, specific. You know who has access to what data. The personal identifiable data, personal health information is. Um, you know there are various compliance. U.S. EMEA has different kind of levels of that. So I think it's building uh, those secure and trusted environments, whether it's within the organization or whether it's to allow the collaborations of what Paul was talking about before, you know, AstraZeneca and, uh, and other parties. So how do you share the data in a, in, a, in a right way? And especially COVID situation exposed this gap where, you know, a lot of effort has been brought in, but then at the same time, um, you know, we still had to be very careful about what is shared, what is available. And also, I think another aspect, and again, it's a bit more of a thought that, uh, you know, when we come from a research and development environments down to the production, there's a lot of elements there to be considered, you know, one is from the kind of scalability issue from kind of how do you take those how do you bridge that gap at the same time it's again it's bringing that security in place it's bringing those um right access and uh right um you know any of the parties who are involved should be uh very aware of the of sensitivity of the data so i think it's one of the main things we see at least in, in our work in our kind of recent engagements Thank you, please. Paul, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, I th I think uh, Galia has, has kind of touched on something that's uh, quite important, which is the whole issue of data in there. You know that we uh, we need to get data that we've consented with appropriately, that is has appropriate governance over it, and these are not simple issues. Uh, we can't we can't just grab data and toss it around because it's and particularly in the case of health data you know it's very private it's very intimate data and so certainly within astro there is a massive amount of effort that's spent on doing this right as i should say across the industry so you know that data is managed very carefully and uh as we obtain new data sources that process is going to have to be continued and in fact expanded as we move into using uh, electronic health record data or uh, people's doctor's data or you know devices that are coming straight from individuals as well. It has to be handled very carefully and it's not just a data science problem, I'm fond of saying with a lot of these things. You know, people's health data is just not data, okay? It is very rich, it's very private, it's very contextual. And so this is why we need people from all sorts of backgrounds working together to do this correctly. Wow, you, you said it very well. You know, mixing different people who have different understanding of data science mm -hmm. and AI and uh, various different things. That brings me to the question about ethics and implications about uh, ethics when you mix different people who don't understand AI it's not your explainable AI that you know are making decisions based on logic that we humans can understand even though AI is now even better in making decisions when it comes to especially um, computer vision image recognition as well when it comes to a cancer for example and it could predict and actually deliver that really care uh, when it comes to uh, health. Um, so what are your thoughts on ethics? I know, um, Milica, you're very passionate about the ethics and, <laughs> and, and biases around that. Mm, I wouldn't call it passionate, but I'm aware of the issues and uh, I, was, uh, I was aware of the 
uh, critical points of many applicants that our um, expert panel uh, introduced. Uh, so I, I think uh, each country should resolve this uh, individually, but also it should be in some kind of uh, collaboration. This is also very important to be um, specified, defined and introduced into new uh, laws and uh, all the procedure wherever AI is uh, blooming, let's say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, but there is this aspect of, you know, what's the relationship between humans and AI? And it's always very, very strange, especially now when when patient is talking to AI or doctor is talking to AI. And there is kind of a, a kind of imbalance in, in what we are used to used to used to have. Um, so, Galia, can you tell us more about these decision making algorithms, how you train the neural network in 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 kind of ethical way that he will rate, make the right decisions uh and you can't blame the doctor but you can blame the ai do you have any thoughts on on, on that aspect of the future sorry you muted can you please unmute yeah, sorry. Uh, for, from our perspective in general, it's uh, never going to be that mach you know machine will take a decision. It's probably always going to be somehow you know assisting to the doctor. That's probably the best case scenario because then you can actually bring that active learning and you can bring the the, the loop you know to close that loop. But at the same time, I think there are certain um, uh, even from the engineering from software engineering perspective, there are certain um, kind of programs and uh, open source packages and kind of other, you know, software available to bring uh, additional capabilities around uh, making sure that the models are fair when, when the models are trained and, you know, you would trust the researchers and the, you know, data scientists to build the best models they can given the data they have and, and, and the particular domain they're in. But then um, you might want to bring some additional toolkits where you can actually assess how well your models are performing on a whole of population or maybe on some particular cohorts of the subpopulation of, 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 of what you're training on and testing. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where we see it's again, it's bringing that additional insight about what is actually your model, how well your model is performing and collecting those insights over the period of time is actually will then give that feedback to the developers and to the data scientists to, to build better models to continue continue on that iterations. Amazing. So I guess time will tell and more data, more structure and unstructured data will will help us more. So we, we have now a few questions from the audience actually and please um whether you're listening and watching this on YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, or Facebook, please put your questions in the comments and then we'll, we'll ask the our panelists these questions. So I would like to bring this question to the table. So do you, uh, Theo, I guess from London is asking, do you have any advice for accessing UK patient date, uh, primary anomic data with academia and how would one approach transferring such data from academic project to commercial use down the line, which is very tricky question, uh, especially with golden rule of NHS here in England. <laughs> uh, Paul, you had quite intense experience working with government on these things, actually. Would you like to take uh, this? Okay, I, I can only offer, it, it's very context dependent. But I, I can say that we do have these big resources like uh, the UK Biopank, CPRD, Genomics England, so on and so forth. And they are, I feel that they are surprisingly easy to deal with, to, to get data with. I mean, it's a very, uh, it's a very rigorous procedure. It's very well governed, uh, governed, governanced and so forth. But uh, for academia, I think that those are just great sources and they're actually they're quite easy to access then and indeed they're even um i'm not sure about the precise details of the commercial access but that can certainly be done some people have said to me that it's quite straightforward in there and in fact that commercial entities don't make enough use of what data is there because i think they believe that it's it's difficult to use or it's only for public academic use, so forth. Now, uh, transferring that data, 
once you start working in academia and then move to commercial circumstance. I don't know about that precisely. I think it might be difficult to change horses midstream, as it were, if you start accessing it in an academic context, then move to commercial. But this is what lawyers are for. So I'm going to refer you to the lawyers for that. <laughs> wow, that's smart. That's smart. So I'm just being conscious of time where we're slowly coming to the end of the session. And I would just like to ask all of our dear panelists for kind of um, advice, whether that's a book that you can recommend or a resource that you can recommend to people that uh, want to learn more about AI and healthcare. Hmm. Yeah, you know, um, I think almost every book that I've read about AI in healthcare is terrible. Uh, <laughs> so what I will say, quite oddly enough, is I think there are, there are a couple of very good online courses to do with like machine learning of AI and AI in healthcare and so forth. And they do tend towards, the, there does tend to be the split between the technical and the operational, if you will. So data science on one hand and how hospital IT works. But between the set of those, I think you can actually get a very good and a very low cost uh, look at the field. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree with Paul. I think there are quite a few good online courses. I think the one book which I probably would recommend for maybe for people who are a bit more new to the industry, uh, just um, it was, I think, released last year by Eric Topol. It's called Deep Medicine. So he goes in a very good overview of various kind of areas and within the industry where the AI can go into. It doesn't go too technical, but it gives a very broad um, picture of where we are now and where we have into. So I would definitely recommend that one. Vladimir, do you have any resources you would like to share? <laughs> yeah, books being held up <laughs> by Valencia. Okay, let's let's see what what you have there, Milita. And if you can unmute yourself, please. Sorry, I keep forgetting that. So this is in Serbian, but I think that uh, it is easily found in any language. It is from a professor from MIT, which he wrote uh, Life 3.0, and it's actually about to be a human in the in the time of intelligence. So it is a little bit of everything, not only AI in health, but it also tackles that. I think very informative and uh, both uh, uh, philosophical and theoretic and practical. And uh, uh, it is a very good mix, either if you're an expert or if you're just uh, a fan of this uh, possibility. And actually something that I was also intrigued by, if I can broader the, the, this, this issue, uh the new the new tv show on amazon prime called uh, called upload it is also very interesting uh uh idea of having our uh, our soul uh, digitalized and then upload this to cloud and connect it using ai to keep communicating with the people on earth who are still alive so this is also something very inspiring it is not uh, related to this um uh, maybe we cannot put it to use uh, anytime soon, but definitely something worth uh, discussing with colleagues. Thank you for that. Vladimir, did you have that? Yes, so regarding the resources, uh, I, I could add uh, the, the challenges that, that I mentioned, the three challenges and also the challenges uh, on, on Kaggle. So usually the, the people that, uh, that are new to the artificial intelligence or, or machine learning, they. Uh, they, they feel fear, they don't want to participate uh, uh, straight, straight away, but uh, there are also great resources uh, uh, and uh, places to, to learn from the community, from the examples that other participants are, uh, uh, are giving. Uh, I think it's a, it's a fast, uh, fast way to, to progress and to, to learn something that is, uh, uh, that's useful in the, in the area that we are familiar with. Well, that's fantastic. I believe that sharing knowledge and kind of creating that collective intelligence is very important. And I'm fascinated actually by, by DeepMind's publications because they're quite kind of um, uh, 
commercial company owned by Google uh, that kind of had their way in coming out of UCL and other universities, but they now share their, their knowledge all, almost as an open source, which is quite, quite um, great read as well. Uh, Stasha, do you have any, any books or resources you would like to share with us? Well, I, I agree. I think I, I have one advice. Uh, being a student at the University of Cambridge, where we have um, many, many courses organized around uh, uh, programming, around AI and machine learning, I think this can be something very interesting that the uh, Serbian ecosystem can introduce, um, either uh, collaborating with uh, uh, certain people uh, in, uh, in the global sites, such as the UK, and, and where we can give uh, short lectures or on what we know uh, in, on these topics, such as genomic medicine, for example. I think this is, a, as we mentioned before, it's a good way to make fertile background for introducing uh, uh, novelties around AI in, in Serbian ecosystem. So, yeah, just a, a tip to, to Milica, maybe. <laughs> Great. Wonderful. Uh, and then just lastly, could you uh, please share any closing remarks and then wh wh where can people find you or if there is anything you would like to promote? Um, shall we start with you, Paul, again? Oh, start with me again. Okay, uh, closing remarks. I think we're at a very interesting time in history that was going to need a lot of different people with a lot of different skills. Uh, we have to keep our eye on actually achieving things that are useful as opposed to things that are just interesting. This might be cool. Uh, if anyone is interested in the wider sort of data science, bioinformatics things, I run a, uh, a bi-monthly uh, meetup in London called Bioinformatics London. Look us up and meet up and maybe you'll see something talk there that you'd be interested in coming along to. Back to you. Thank you very much. Galia? Yeah, thanks. Uh, it was a pleasure to be here. Uh, I completely agree with Paul around that interdisciplinary thinking, the skills we need in this uh, space to, you know, to make things happen and to bring some new innovation too. I, um, if you're interested in learning a bit more what Microsoft is doing in this space, so we actually have our, our developer conference next week, which is free of charge and it's online obviously this year. It's called Microsoft Ignite, and there will be quite a few announcements actually within the healthcare space and uh, further progress we, we're making. So um, I definitely recommend if you could spend some time to watch those. Thanks again. I will do, absolutely. Um, Melissa? Uh, I would like to introduce you to visit our uh, website and uh, to see and uh, also our uh, social media. Uh, we will introduce very soon all the projects that are supported by the Science Fund uh, related to AI. So I think there is a lot of possibility for collaboration with uh, all those different uh, uh, institutions in Serbia. And uh, I think that uh, you, might, uh, you might find very interesting and surprising uh, which areas and uh, AI technologies are being used for this kind of uh, project. Fantastic. Vladimir, would you like to share something special? Yeah, uh, I would agree with, with Paul. We will live in a very interesting, uh, interesting times, uh, uh, more interesting than a few years back and less interesting than a few years after. <laughs> and generally, the, the area of uh, uh, Artificial intelligence in, in health and, uh, uh, and biomedicine and uh, in general precision medicine, uh, it's something that it's uh, exponentially growing. Uh, I would compare it uh, to the growth of uh, IT that started 25 years ago. And I, I think it's nowadays with, with, the, with the large amounts of, uh, of genomics or sequence data of, uh, of health records and uh, the pharma companies uh, that, uh, that support the, the science behind uh, the kind of it that, uh, that drives this uh, this growth, uh, I, I think it will uh, it, it will come to, to at least different level with the IT industry in general like in a in a short uh, uh, period of time. And uh, regarding the the context and the things that I've been doing, you can you can find me on uh, on Twitter or LinkedIn if you're interested in some of the topics that uh, we've been discussed. Just uh, uh, write a message; I'll be I'll be happy to, to respond. 
amazing uh, Stasha. Any any closing remarks from you? Well, but firstly, uh, I would I would like to thank to all our panelists for being part of this webinar. Uh, it's a pity that we had technical issues at the beginning, so we lost a uh, number of of audience and as well as the energy with them. So uh, hopefully next time it will be better. Uh, thank you for bringing uh, new evidence for the AI world on table uh, during this webinar. Uh, thanks for the great discussion. Thanks to Peter for moderating this session. And uh, finally, thanks to uh, all the partners that are supporting uh, work of uh, Innovation Forum in Serbia, uh, where we are bridging the gap between science industry and the government uh, in the healthcare sector and trying to work with healthcare startups to build them and boost their development. Um, thanks to Science Technology Park, thanks to Health Tech Lab, and uh, thanks to Peter finally again. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Well, yeah, it was absolute pleasure, really. It's, it's, it's also a true honor to kind of have this uh, conversation and to be part of it. I would like to thank Stasha and everyone, uh, panelists, uh, all the audience and everyone who joined in, who asked questions, and, and also to Tech London Advocates for connecting us all. Um, and hopefully we will make more of these soon. Um, so well, thank you all and enjoy. Thank you. Bye-bye.